Hi, I'm Joel Carver here at VCU's Autism Center for Excellence, and my presentation today is A Strange Story from a Strange Life, My Life in the Neurodiversity Student Group. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to uh, the, the wonderful people here at VCU's Autism Center for Excellence for having me. Uh, it's a huge opportunity. I really appreciate it. And without further ado, let's get started. So I apologize for this slide. It, you, can, you can see me. I didn't realize that when I was making the presentations. It is, uh, I, I have facial hair now, but that's not crucially important. Um, and as every, as every professor or guest lecturer at a university will do, I'll discuss who I am, why I'm here, why sh you should be listening to me. Um, I'm a junior at the College of William and Mary. I'm currently majoring in biology, uh, class of 2017. Woo. Um, created the neurodiversity student group at William and Mary. We'll talk more about that later because I, I can't say that I founded it, but I can say that I made it is, made it what it is today. Uh, but you know, got to keep a little bit of secrecy. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout. I am an autistic self advocate, which means before before anybody goes, wait a minute, what? Uh, I am autistic, um, and now we know. And I am a public speaker, a little bit of a public speaker, hoping to uh, to build that up as we go along. And let's see here. Okay, I was born at Fairfax Hospital. Now, I put this on here because it's it's a little bit more of a story than it sounds like. You know, okay, you were born, whatever. Um, I was actually born after ten weeks early after some serious medical complications. Uh, so I consider that a part of my life story because I am lucky to have even been alive in the first place. Um, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in, I believe it was kindergarten. Yeah, um, nope. My bad. Uh, I was seven. I was seven when I was diagnosed with Asperger's, um, and I didn't know about this until later. But my parents, and this is this is an important piece of how I ended up where I am today. My parents worked like madmen uh, to learn as much as they possibly could. They really dedicated themselves to learning because their goal was to improve my quality of life and. Obviously, every parent of an autistic child wants the best for their child, but it was specifically with the goal not of improving my ability to do one thing or to make me normal, but to make the life that I was going to live as good as it possibly could be. Um, I lived in, well, well, okay. So after being born in Fairfax, I was moved around a while, lived in Washington, D.C., lived in Leesburg immediately after I was born. Um, but eventually settled in Arlington for a while. This is where I spent my early childhood. Um, it's pretty much a suburb of D.C., but kind of growing on its own right now. Um, eventually, I moved out into the middle of nowhere, Remington, Virginia. Uh, if you've ever heard of this, I'm sorry. Um, between second and third grade. Now, it's a little bit out of order here because I was actually tested for the GT program in kindergarten. Um, it was a rough process, and I feel that this is applicable to the parents of autistic children who are hopefully listening to this and to psychological professionals, because when I was tested originally, um, I was slated for the bottom third of, uh, of ability. And after being tested, again, separately, outside of my school, um, they decided that that was not the case and that I was eligible for the GT program. Um, after moving to Remington, I was kind of tested again because there was a struggle of not, not an inability to keep up with the material, but a lack of interest in the material. And I think that a lot of, a lot of autistic people have a struggle with people perceiving that they can't when really it's that they don't um, in terms of, of doing schoolwork. I struggled immensely with uh, staying on task um, not for a lack of ability, but for a lack of interest. And so uh, it was decided that I would take a fourth grade science class uh, during third grade to be partially accelerated. Um, that went very well. My grades notably improved. And so after an arduous process, which involved numerous paperwork, numerous types of paperwork, a test, the whole school, you know, having to uh, sign a piece of paper in blood, it, it seemed like at the time. Um, 
I was whole grade accelerated. I was actually the first person in the school to be whole grade accelerated from third grade straight to fifth grade. Um, and I mention this because it was a significant decision to do so uh, because my already existing social deficits were complicated by the fact that I was emotionally, uh, mentally a year behind um, in terms of development. My ability may have been at a fifth grade level, but my social skills were not. Um, and it was an interesting year. I transitioned from a, you know, the, the, the smart kid. It was, it was fun. For a couple glorious weeks, uh, children would approach me and talk about, you know, oh, you're the smart kid. Say something smart. It was, um, it was children being children. And that, that did not last long, so don't think that I had uh, a relaxing elementary or middle school experience because uh, people very quickly realized it was more fun to make fun of me than to, uh, than to praise me. I, I, I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, and because of my autism, I didn't have the social skills to circumvent that. I rapidly became a target for bullying, and this is something that I've heard a lot of autistic people and a lot of parents of autistic people talk about. Um, I wish that I had, in my experience, a, a way, an, an easy solution, um, something that I could say to fix that problem entirely, but I don't. What I can say is that it's crucially important if an autistic child is being bullied to address with this child by the parents, by the people at school, that it is not a lack of their rights as a person that leads to this. It's not a lack of value. It's not a lack of significance. It's the other child feeling a need to push themselves up. Um, this can lead, I will, I will warn, to other social difficulties, especially because autistic people, myself included, tend to verbalize what they believe to be the truth. Um, they may tell their peers that, you know, oh, you're just looking for a rise out of me, and that is, that is not a useful uh, tactic for handling bullying. But I believe with all of my heart that it is the best thing to, to tell an autistic child that they have value and to reinforce the notion that it is not them, but the people bullying them that is leading to their treatment. Um, on the subject of bullying, I transferred, whatever, to Taylor Middle School. I, I don't like the, the use of graduation when referring to elementary to middle school and from middle school to high school. So transitioned, that's the word I decided to use. Um, I transitioned to Taylor Middle School, which was not the um, exciting, introduction to the adult world that I thought it would be as a fifth grader. Um, it was more of the same. It was, the bullying really, really started in middle school in full intensity. Um, a couple of kids singled me out as an easy target and I was very quickly put on the bottom of the social pile. And I say pile because it is a pile. All of the children are unsure of exactly where they are because they're in a writhing mass of social complexity that no one really understands and they're all pushing anyone down they can to be on top. This is incredibly, this is an incredibly difficult time for autistic people because neurotypicals have no idea what they're doing. How would autistics? There's no, there's no real, there's no defined social strata. It's all hormones and transitions and adjustments from childhood to adolescence and it could be entirely where I grew up, but there was a large focus on growing up um, in middle school and even in fifth grade. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to drop all of the childhood interests in favor of more adult interests. Um, this is a struggle for a lot of autistic people because it's a time when people haven't really come to terms with you do you. and. My, my, my story was Pokemon. I loved Pokemon. I still do. But transitioning from elementary school to middle school, not a lot of people did, and certainly not with the intensity that I did. So it, I, I was an easy target because it was okay for me if they didn't like Pokemon, but it was not okay for them that I did, that I did like Pokemon. So I hope Nintendo doesn't get upset that I'm using it. I, I know it's trademarked, but we're going we're gonna to find out. Um, and 
because of this, because of the intensity with which I liked Pokemon, um, it, it was easy to target that and get me upset. I became an easy target for bullying in fifth grade, and that shipped right off into middle school. Um, also in middle school, I believe it was seventh grade, but I have, I have no memory of this conversation, um, I was informed for the first time that I was diagnosed with something on the spectrum. At the time I was diagnosed in, well, when I was seven, um, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Uh, they have since done away with that, and it is now technically autism spectrum disorder. I identify as an autistic person rather than a person with Asperger's. Um, although I use the words interchangeably a lot. So understand that through this talk, uh, I may use them interchangeably. That's my preference. The, the technically correct thing is autism spectrum disorder. Just want to, to clarify that for parents because I know that that's a, an issue of contention among autistic self-advocates, psychological professionals, and parents. Also in middle school, I joined the BSA, the Boy Scouts of America. This is something that I highly recommend for any, situationally recommend for any parents of autistic people. Um, Cub Scouts was something that I was in much earlier and was not a pleasant experience, but I can say that Boy Scouts with parental support was a fantastic place for me growing up. It was an opportunity not just to experience the world, uh, gain valuable skills, learn how to interact with my peers. Um, I did a lot of social learning in Boy Scouts, and it was a place that was free from a lot of the uh, more complex social behaviors. It's a very simple place. The big kids want to be big kids, the little kids want to be big kids too, and therefore the little kids end up getting pushed away from the big kids by the big kids, and it's just um, very archetypal when you have the different age groups. But at the same time, it was easier to comprehend. Uh, it was by no means a perfect organization, nor a perfect uh, group, but it was a wonderful experience because I got to feel confidence in myself. I got to be proud of who I am and what I could do rather than be ashamed of it like I was going to middle school. Um, eventually, I transitioned to Liberty High School. Now, I've talked a little bit about middle school and I have one more point to make before I jump fully into high school, and that is that it is crucially important during middle school for the parents of an autistic child to support not only the parent-child relationship, but also the child's relationship with their friends. Um, as anyone can tell you, except maybe a couple extreme extroverts, it is difficult to make new friends. It is di even more difficult to make new friends in middle school. Um, I was actually sent to a more distant middle school because it was where a lot of my friends were going, a lot of my friends from elementary school. And this was tremendously significant because it meant that I could, I could hold on to that group of friends rather than struggling to find anyone at all to connect with. And outside of school, I was given a lot of opportunities to connect with my peers, to hang out with friends and further those relationships because obviously friendships are a huge part of social interactions with other people. And learning with a couple people meant that I had much better odds of success when I was engaging at school in general. Uh, so I highly recommend fostering not just parent-child relationships, but also child relationships with their peers. Um, situationally, observe your child's friends. Make sure that they are a good fit for your children um, because it is important that they have friends and it is important that those friends are good friends to them. Now, high school, one of the uh, up until this point, it was the biggest transition period of my life. It was the biggest time of personal growth. Um, and a lot of things in high school put me on the path that I'm on today as an autistic self-advocate, as a bio major, and as a William & Mary student. Um, the first point that I'll talk about is joining the swim team. Uh, I was sports avoidant for most of my life. Um, I dabbled in soccer in second grade, but it's not a good fit for a lot of autistic people. Have you ever seen like child sports, early children's sports? It's not a it's not a fun place. The kids all want to win. They all want to be the best. It is cutthroat, and the parents want to win more than they care about you know their their kids doing okay. They they just want that win. They want their kid to be the best. And, and 
it's a lot of uh, social pressure from the kids to each other, from the parents to the kids, and um, in addition to having asthma, it was socially a place that I did not want to be. I did not enjoy team sports. But uh, it was decided that I would join the swim team because uh, something that's fairly common is clumsiness on land, lack of coordination on land, leads to grace in water among autistic people. Um, I was a, a decent natural swimmer and joined the swim team um, because I wanted to, to be in shape. I wanted to um, broaden my horizons and, of course, because my parents wanted me to, to do a sport so that they could get into college. Um, and it really was a novel experience because a lot of the friends that I'd had in middle school had gone their separate ways. They all wanted to be, you know, their own people, socially significant, and had left me in the dust as soon as they possibly could. Um, but with the swim team, it was it was friendship based in uh, mutual suffering um, because we all we all trained hard. Never did well, but it was a good experience, um, and it was unique because it was an individual sport. Uh, my performance, while it did affect the team in a general sense, I was not competing uh, with, with my team. I was competing with myself for a better time. Um, and there was, the, the swim team was great because they didn't place pressure on me. There was no, if you don't do better, we won't be your friend or we'll beat you up in the locker room. It was, do as well as you can. We're here to support you. And... If you can find an environment like that for an autistic child, it will do wonders for their sense of belonging and self-esteem. I decided to take a psychology class my senior year of high school, partially because psychology is interesting and partially because it had a record as the easiest class in the county and I wanted to get an A in it so that my uh, AP classes were cushioned. Um, I was taking this class and was assigned a book report on a developmental disorder. It was not Asperger's Syndrome, so naturally when I uh, was assigned it, I said, hey, I don't want to do this. Teacher, can I present something on Asperger's Syndrome? They said, yeah, sure, whatever, that's totally fine. So I read Tony Atwood's book on Asperger's Syndrome, The Complete Guide to Asperger's, and it was a profound and life-changing experience, but more on that later. Um, I came to understand my diagnosis in a way that I hadn't before um, and chose to speak to my psychology class about autism and the fact that I was autistic. Um, it was really the defining experience that set me on the path that I am on now. I've had, I've had many of these because, of course, without one, I wouldn't be where I am now. But speaking and being accepted was huge. I was able to talk about who I was, and instead of people saying, oh, he's that weird kid, it was, oh, he makes sense now. We'll accept you. Um, so to everyone in that class, thank you. Um, it made a big difference in my life. Um, ironically enough, that was on Friday the 13th of 2012 in December. Um, December 15th, of 2012, I was accepted into William and Mary. And so two huge life-changing events happened within the span of two days, and the only thing that happened in between was uh, shooting a bunch of people with plastic BBs. Um, it was a very significant weekend. And William and Mary, I believe, is truly a great school for autistic people. But enough of that pitch. Uh, I reached Eagle Scout while I was in high school. Um, and I am very glad that I did that. I, I, I don't have too much to say on that. It's not a complicated thing. I will give a piece of advice to any parents who have autistic children or psychologists who have non-autistic children, anyone who has children who are in Boy Scouts. Uh, don't think that the Eagle Scout is limited to making benches. Um, some of you out there won't think too highly of this because it was made using a video game, but I actually recorded a public service announcement and played it to my high school about drunk driving. Um, and it was, I believe that it had more of an impact than a bench in a park. So don't, don't limit yourself if, if you can do more than just benches. 
because there's a lot out there and you never know how far you'll go until you try. So I got to William and Mary and orientation was a, it was, it was something all right. I know a couple of autistic people in college and the orientation process is um, very polarizing. Uh, it was a rough time for me. It was painful, it was intense, and it was, it, it pushed my limits. But I am very grateful that I went through it because it made me who I am today. I came out of that crucible with a lot more confidence, um, a lot more belief in myself and my social abilities. Uh, I, I really invent, reinvented myself, which I think is a huge benefit of the freshman year experience in college. Um, eventually, right before the deadline, as most things I do uh, end up happening, uh, I declared my major to be biology um, because they didn't have an autism advocacy major at William and Mary yet, um, and created the neurodiversity student group. Now, I said I mentioned, I'd mention this later during the first couple slides, and I will mention this more later, but I will say that uh, the neurodiversity student group is a group at William and Mary um, for students, by students, supported by the faculty for neurodiverse people. Uh, originally, it was one member who had been recruited by campus faculty uh, because she was on the autism spectrum with the goal of uh, improving the campus for autistic people. Um, she did a great job, Danielle Thomas, shout out. Um, and it was because of her and because of a presentation on autism that I gave to my freshman hall during orientation um, that I joined the neurodiversity student group and said, man, this is great. We should get more people in this, which has led to what it is today. Um, and here I am, a junior at William and Mary, an autistic self-advocate, a public speaker, and looking forward. Um, I'd like to do more public speaking and spread the good word, so to speak. Um, but let's talk about some stuff that isn't my life. Just kidding, it's more of my life. Um, so I have this picture up here because I remember several of the conversations I had about coming to terms with my diagnosis. When I was first told that I had Asperger's syndrome, I went, no, that's impossible, no, because I didn't understand what autism was. I, I had heard the word autism and the connotation in today's society is very negative. Um, I didn't fully understand the subject. so. I just rejected it. I talked to a bunch of friends, you know, well, what if, what if I have this? I, I, I do this thing, I do this thing, I, I don't know. But I'd never, I'd never taken the time to look up the symptoms and look at myself objectively to see if I had them. I had just heard syndrome and shut down. And eventually I got around this because I said, you know, if I have this thing, I've had it my entire life. I am still the same person whether I say I don't have it, whether I say that I do have it. If I wake up tomorrow and say I am an autistic person, the only thing that's changed is that I have said that. I am the same person regardless. And I think that's for any parents trying to help their kids understand their diagnosis and come to terms with who they are, I think it's a very powerful tool. It's not like being diagnosed with the flu. It's not something you got last week and will be gone in a couple weeks, nor is it something that you've acquired through the course of your life. And that's crucially important for parents to understand. This is a genetic, lifelong condition. And I'm not saying this because there's no hope. That's not at all true. I'm saying this because for autistic people to be successful and happy, they and the people supporting them need to understand that they will be autistic their entire lives. And that's not a bad thing, it just means they're different. So a big part of coming to terms with my diagnosis was, despite the fact that I've got the William & Mary logo here because it's not quite applicable yet, um, was this psychology class. I had a great experience in high school with this, psych with this one class. Um, and this presentation was huge. But what I think was even more huge was reading 
Tony Atwood's book and seeing list of symptoms and having it all laid out and looking in the pages of a book describing a medical condition and seeing a mirror, seeing almost every single facet of my personality affected in some way by the list of symptoms that I saw, that all of the things that I'd been trying to understand my entire life, why I was so fixated on X, Y, or Z, why I loved Pokemon or Pikmin or Dark Souls or whatever so much, was not that I was a freak, which was what I believed until then. I was not a monster or a misfit or a reject. I was an autistic person. It was a part of who I was. I was not alone, and that realization profoundly changed my outlook on life and is why I decided that I needed to talk about it and why I'm still on the, that path today. Because I don't know if I broke down in tears while I was reading this, but I know that I have since because of its implications. And I know that it was and is the most significant and life-changing event that I've ever gone through because it redefined my self-image and was tremendous in making me the person that I am today. Now, this is President Reevely. Hurrah for President Reevely. He's great. He's the president of William and Mary. Um, the next step on my journey to becoming an autistic self-advocate was during orientation. I really struggled with making myself as socially open as possible because I wanted more friends. I wanted more people to have a positive perception of me. And it was really that goal that pushed me into the realm of someone who was not just socially competent, but socially successful. And I think it's that, that goal that separates a lot of autistic people who have become, I won't say successful because I will in no way define success by the number of friends that you have. However, it is hard to, to be happy as a child or as a teenager when you feel that you only have three or four friends. And it was the goal of, I'm, I want these people to like me. Not be my friends, not be my best friend, because I've wanted that my entire life. It was that transition to, I want to be the kind of person that people appreciate. And that led to tremendous personal growth and a new outlook that led me to uh, develop social skills through attempted mimicry, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, I decided to give a talk about autism to my freshman hall because after my high school experience with giving this presentation, after being accepted for who I was rather than seen as a strange outlier um, in high school, I, I really knew that if I was going to be successful, if I was going to be happy in college, I needed the people around me to understand how autism affected me, that I wasn't like everyone else. And why? Because that understanding meant that people could be more patient, they could be more understanding, for the same reason that you wouldn't expect someone with a broken leg to walk up a flight of stairs. I might not be able to do something that one of the other people in my hall could, and having that understanding, that connection, I thought and did make my life substantially better. And during this presentation, I affected two people. Haley, the uh, current leader of the Neurodiversity Student Group at William & Mary, and my RA, Kendra Jackson, um, who said, you know, I know someone who would really appreciate this, and went to uh, Danielle, who was the first member of the Neurodiversity Student Group, and said, I have an autistic student on my hall. You should, you should talk to him. You should, guys should get to know each other. And that led to the Neurodiversity Student Group um, in, its, in its current incarnation. Uh, now, this is a picture that I'm, I'm very proud of. On the left, for those of you who don't know, you have Steve Olitsky, author of the uh, tremendously influential and significant uh, book, Neurotribes, um, a world-changing history of autism. Uh, on the right, we have John Elder Robeson, 
uh, three times New York Times best-selling author, uh, scholar in residence at William and Mary, and my mentor. And in the middle, you have me. You're getting from ear to ear like a fool uh, to be around such awesome people. Um, and I, I have the exercise ball up there because I remember a very funny story uh, from my freshman hall that um, has absolutely no significance, but one of the people on, on my hall, uh, we were playing soccer with a, with a yoga ball, one of the big ones, and he ended up kicking it, and it bounced across the hall into a door, across the hall into the wall, across the hall into the exit sign that was hanging from the ceiling, and it just went. Um, I have a lot of fond memories of my freshman year, and it was a hard time, but I want any parents of autistic people to know that it is a huge challenge, but can lead to huge success. It can lead to a different life. Now, this is the neurodiversity student group. What a motley crew we are. Um, this, is, this is an outdated picture, so some of the members have graduated, some of them have gone on their merry ways, but in the middle, with no sleeves, uh, in December is me, and two people to my left, the, the shortest one, is Haley, uh, the current leader of the neurodiversity student group and a fantastic advocate. Um, for those of you who have heard me use this word and have never heard it before and are not quite sure I know what it means, um, neurodiversity is a rising self-advocacy movement. Started, and I'm going to you know, end up reading off of the slide a little more than I'd like to, um, started by, but by no means limited to, autistic people. Um, there was a movement a little while back among the autistic population to appreciate the strengths and differences of autistic people rather than just the uh, detriments of being autistic. Um, but the core tenets of neurodiversity are that all people have value, that personhood is a granted right to all humans, and that should not be taken away for any reason, whether disability, difference, or anything else that's covered in any other diversity or civil rights uh, thing. Um, and secondly, that brain differences have value to society. In a very pragmatic way, neurodiversity is useful because, for example, this is, this is an example that uh, is used a lot among neurodiverse uh, advocates, um, modern classrooms are where they are because of autistic people. And will it be improved because of accommodations for autistic people? The example frequently used is lighting. Some lighting is very harsh and does not lead to effective learning. It leads to headaches and lack of attention. Now, this has been demonstrated, but if you ask young children, which lighting do you prefer, they may not be able to tell you. They may, may not notice a difference, but autistic people will. An autistic student may notice that there's a smell in the room that ends up making all the kids drool and ready for lunch before anyone else does. They may not even process it, but an autistic person will. And it's that universal search for accessibility, accommodation, um, that leads to positive social change. Uh, another great example is elevators. Elevators were made for people in wheelchairs with polio. Because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, almost every building in America that has multiple floors is required to have an elevator. Now, I'm going to ask a question. How many people out there have never ridden an elevator in their life? I'm waiting. Oh, wait, that's right. You guys can't hear me. Just kidding. Um, but because elevators were created for people with disabilities, now people who want to move heavy things up several floors don't have to use construction equipment. They don't have to hire a bunch of people and try to cram something into a staircase. Elevators are a huge boon to many groups of people from, as I've just said, people trying to move heavy equipment or desks up office buildings, people who have 67 floors to go up before they can get to their floor, people trying to pitch to the boss but only can trap them in an elevator for 15 seconds a day. Elevators have had a huge positive success on corporate America and all of America. 
but wouldn't exist if it were not for the Americans, dis well, not, not exist, but not be as prevalent as they are without the Americans for Disabilities Act. And this is just one example. There are others, but I won't bore you with droning on about that. Um, I'll stick to the exciting story of my life and how awesome I am. Um, move on. So, the objectives of the neurodiversity group at William & Mary, the neurodiversity student group, are advocacy, support, and education. I bet you'd never guess. Um, advocacy uh, is focused on making changes for any given person who is struggling to make changes on their own. With 10 or 20 or 30 voices all saying, hey, we're struggling, we need help, it is received a lot better and more quickly than a single person that's saying, I need help with this. They can easily be ignored or just told no. But when you have a bunch of us raising a stink about it, you can't ignore it. And while we haven't had troubles like that in, in my memory at William & Mary, um, I think it's important for things like this to, to exist. Um, because it, it means that if for, no, no, if for no other reason than so that those voices can be heard. And not just heard, but welcomed. Because that promotes uh, thought on the subject. Second goal is support. It's really hard as an autistic person to feel welcome in a large group of people in a college uh, when you don't have a small group that you know well. Um, it's the same effect that uh, toddlers have when they're growing up. And this is for all people going to college, but more so for autistics. Um, when in a new environment, a toddler will find attachment security with their mother and then explore. Once they feel safe and comfortable and protected, they'll go off and be adventurous, but it's because of that base they're able to do so. When people go to college, it's because of their roommates or their freshman hall or their frat that they're able to branch out and try new things. And the neurodiversity group aims to provide a, a similar support group for neurodiverse people or anyone who's looking for it and just happens to stumble to us before they uh, find any other groups. Um, because it's, it's a challenge. And especially if you have a perspective that isn't shared, if you are 2% of the population and are struggling to deal with the fact that you can hear in one of your lecture halls the fan going the entire class over the professor and aren't able to sort out the noise, or that you can't eat at most of the dining halls because the food is mixed and tastes really intense and unpalatable, or because you're just really struggling socially and don't have anyone to turn to. That's what we're there for. And finally, education. Um, this is one of my favorite things uh, for in terms of the neurodiversity student group's actions because to me, the most important change in my life regarding Asperger's and autism is understanding. When I understood that I had Asperger's, I came to terms with who I was as a person in a way that I hadn't before. I could understand myself. I could start at that point and work outward to find out who I was. It was because my friends knew that they were more tolerant, that if I said something unintentionally hurtful, that they could come to me and say, hey, I know you have Asperger's. Have you it was, what did you mean by this? And I can promptly apologize rather than losing a friend over it. Spreading information, especially with the lack of information present in a, a good chunk of the American public, makes education hugely important for autistic people and for any neurodiverse condition. At past, we've, well, past events, not terribly complicated. Um, we've had a discussion panel with Health Outreach Peer Education, a program at William & Mary designed around uh, mental and physical health, um, where we talked to educators in that group about neurodiversity, about what uh, anxiety, depression, ADD, and autism could mean for college students, and how these bright young people could help others deal with it in their, you know, with their peers. Uh, we've been reaching out with uh, Corpus, which is an up-and-coming disability. I'm not sure if it's right or uh, 
support group on William & Mary campus, but they are a fantastic group of people, and I look forward to working with them in the future. And most recently, we've had the Disability Day of Mourning, uh, supported by the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and run by Haley, the current leader of the Neurodiversity Student Group. Uh, it was a heartbreaking but very well done event, and I haven't told her this, I need to, need to send out a message. Um, but Haley did a fantastic job with this. It was very well orchestrated, and everyone involved has, has my utmost respect for participating. Neurodiversity at large. Neurodiversity is growing very rapidly. It's supported by large groups such as SAP, an international software firm, uh, William & Mary, and hopefully soon VCU. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, and I'm really hopeful for where, where it's going because it is, I believe, the next step in the universal civil rights movement which of course the civil rights movements of the 1960s are by no means over and I'm not just I'm just I'm just leaving that can of worms unopened but I think it's the next direction for America and the world to take because it's it's had a, a sordid history with institutionalization and all sorts of uh, nasty things and we're at a really good place right now and more importantly making really good progress so I have hope. I have hope for neurodiversity. Now, I've got a little bit of time left, or maybe a lot of time left. I have no sense of time. Um, and I'd like to discuss a couple of symptoms of autism and Asperger's because, as I said earlier, understanding is huge. Um, now, parents, psychological professionals, teachers, you've probably heard these symptoms described, hyperfixation or uh, hyperfocusing couple other names for it, but these are symptoms that I feel I can provide a little insight to that maybe your kid just hasn't gotten to a point where they realize that they're different. Um, maybe your child is nonverbal and you're struggling to find a way to communicate with them, or maybe you've just never heard this side of the story because you've never been around a, you know, adult autistic person. Look at me, I'm an adult, I need some adult help. Um, and in addition to hyperfixation, sensory stuff, because that's complicated and hard to describe unless you are dedicated to learning about it, and social skills, the most uh, frequently referenced symptom of autism. Now, Nintendo, please don't sue me. This is Pikmin, for those of you who don't recognize it. Uh, Pikmin is a GameCube and now Wii U game one of my favorite games of all time. I, I was madly in love with Pikmin 2 when I was in uh, middle school and had so much fun with it, but it's more than that because I probably spent more energy thinking about Pikmin than I did about my middle school education. Now, to, to, to clarify, it's not that I spent more time playing Pikmin. I, I had limited video game time as a kid and I did not like that, but when I wasn't playing Pikmin, I was thinking about it. I was creating ideas. I was thinking about new and exciting creatures that I could, you know, suggest to Nintendo to include in the game. And I'm, I'm very proud of this. I've looked at Pikmin 3, and some of the things that they've done actually match what I came up with back in middle school. So I'm, I know it's just because of the numbers, and they had to include, you know, one of my 15,000 ideas, but I'm still happy that one of them showed up. So that's, that's another thing. But hyperfixation is more than just being really into something. It is feeding off of an interest in a way that I have only ever seen neurotypical do when they are in puppy love. When you are completely fixated, completely absorbed in something, and you want to spend all of your time on that one topic, on that one person, with that person, that is the kind of intensity that hyperfixation involves. You feed off of it. You get energy from thinking about it. You're excited by it. And anything else that you do requires constant energy to just pry yourself away from it. 
And it's not something that's, that you can just drop. You can't say, oh, I'll just stop being interested in this. Because it's not so much that you're interested in it as that you need to learn about it. You need to think about it. And it is a beautiful and wonderful experience. And good lord, is it hard to deal with when you're trying to do something that isn't think about Pikmin. Like, you know, do well in middle school. Um, something that I'd like to mention on this is how crucially important it is for parents not just to tolerate but to support their children's fixations. Now, of course, you can suggest new things, and you always should, because autistic people, myself included, have a tendency to do what's comfortable rather than try new things. Always be gently opening ways for them to expand themselves and their interests. Be careful with when you push it, because I definitely grew as a child when I was pushed. But there are also some situations where I would say it would have been better if I hadn't been. And it's all, it's all guesswork, so do the best you can as a parent, because you won't know until you try. Um, however, please, 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 from an autistic person to you, support your child's fixations, because they will not let go of them because they're not supported. They will only let go of them when they are done with it. And that happens. Sometimes it'll be a couple weeks, sometimes it'll be a couple months, and sometimes it'll be a couple decades. You don't know when it's going to last. You don't know maybe their interest in trains, as stereotypical as that is, will lead them to be a train engineer, will lead them to be an electrical engineer when they start working on computers. It's hard to know when that'll matter, and when, when you'll be backing a horse that'll get all the way to the finish line of their life, and when it's something that they'll just be interested in for a couple of days or weeks. But it is exhausting as an autistic person to try and regulate your interests for the sake of being friends with people. Trying to rein in this intensity because other people just don't want to hear about it because they're lame and they don't like Pikmin. But to have a parent support a special interest is huge. Because it means not just, oh, my parent supports me having fun with this, but that they have someone to share it with, and they will go on. I mean, I have seen myself do this, and good God, it'll be hours before they run out of stuff to talk about, and then they'll get right back into it and come out 15 minutes later with another small lecture series that could be hosted at Harvard. The intensity is beautiful to experience and exhausting when it's not your fixation, and I get that. But please, support your child's fixations because the emotional feed of being able to share that with someone is huge. And that's why a lot of students, a lot of autistic students, have good relationships with their teachers because they can go talk about history or trains or science with one of their teachers or professors. It will make a huge difference. Don't just say, okay, that's good, son. Get involved. Learn about it. You might just find it interesting. The next sense, since symptom is not nearly as fun to talk about. Um, Overstimulation is something that a lot of autistic people have to deal with on a regular basis and can be absolutely crushing. Now I have a couple of ways of trying to explain what it's like to be overstimulated, to be autistic in an environment that's not autistic friendly. And I think the best way that I can explain it is I want you to imagine being in a room full of people all of whom are talking to you, not to each other, to you directly. And you have to not only pay attention to what they're saying, because they'll get offended if you don't, you also have two earbuds in. And it's not that you're listening to one thing, it's that you're listening to two different things. You're listening to God Save the Queen, played by Five Finger Death Punch at max volume, and you can't hear your own thoughts over it, and in the other ear you have an extremely complex technical instruction, maybe a lecture on thermonuclear astrophysics, and there will be a test at the end. And if you don't listen to that, you're screwed. 
You're not going to do well in class. You're not going to listen to your friends when they're talking in the lunchroom. You're not going to be able to follow the conversation. And you're going to get a headache from the noise in your other ear. As well as the constant bombarding of input from all of the other people in the room. And it can be something that intense or it can be something as simple as you're in a room with a bunch of people talking to one person and you can hear every single conversation all the way around the room as well as you can hear that person. Which is to say, not very, because you can't filter any of them out. On the flip side of this, you have extreme tolerance. I don't normally wear sleeves. It's just not a thing I do. I don't get cold until it's below freezing most of the time. Um, and frequently this happens with autistic people. They will have a sense or a perception of a sense. Maybe it's not so much temperature as it is cold. I do not do well when it gets warm. But I do really well when it's cold. I don't do well when there's a lot of different noises, but I also don't do well when there's a single noise that's really loud most of the time. Um, so it, it can be all kinds of things, but understand that your child will likely struggle with where exactly the line is, and you will probably struggle as a parent or psychological professional trying to get a kid to put on a coat when they are in fact sweating understand that yes, they may have some weird looks thrown their way, but find a balance between what does them harm because of the social repercussions and what does them harm because they're sweating like crazy in a light sweater when it's below freezing. And the last subject here is meltdowns, which is something I'm sure parents of autistic children are very familiar with. A full meltdown is something that I wouldn't wish on even the, the bullies that I had in middle school who were uh, formative, shall we say, in my life perspective. Um, a full meltdown is a horrible experience because it is not just being overwhelmed to the point of exhaustion, it is losing that sense of agency because you are unable to shut out those senses. You are unable to stop the stress, the pain that is coming into your brain from doing so. And it can be really rough getting out of that, not just experiencing it, but trying to end it. And I won't say that I have the miracle cure to that because I don't. And I ask you as parents of autistic people, as friends of autistic people, as caregivers or psychological professionals or teachers, Please, for the love of God, avoid your child or any autistic child having a meltdown if at all possible because as bad as it is for you having to pick them up in the middle of a grocery store, it is worse for them. I can promise you that. And I can't give you a this will always work solution, but I can give you two things that have helped me. I can't claim credit for the second one. The first is Remove the stimuli. This is something that will probably work in almost all cases. If you can separate them from what is causing the meltdown at all, it will help. The second, much more specific, is ask them about a special interest. This is something that I wouldn't have thought of unless uh, someone very close to me had done it when I was having a meltdown and I have had only, I can, I can count the number of meltdowns I've had in memory on my hands, but they are not something that you forget. Um, and anyone who is able to help you get out of that is someone that is very significant, because that's not something that's easy to find. Anyway, the topic that did not, not topic, the idea that was used was they asked me about my special interest because it is very difficult to stay upset, to stay not even upset, it's, it's difficult to do anything but follow that path, even if that means shutting off 
it, it, it's a distraction. And it's such a good distraction, even when you don't want it to be, that even in such an intense situation as a meltdown, if you can break in and get them to hear that, you know, tell me about this thing. One of the ones that I hear a lot from parents nowadays is Minecraft. Tell me about Minecraft. How does this work? Keep asking questions. Stay involved. Make it clear that you are trying to engage them on this because it is not something that happens a lot. And that's one of the reasons it's so important. Because it is, it is a pull, the likes of which neurotypicals will likely never experience. And it can work. It may not. I'm not saying that anyone should believe 100% that this will work, but give it a shot once or twice. And best of luck to you and to whatever poor child is having to go through a meltdown that you would be trying that because it is not a fun time. And my last little bit here is social skills, something that's very important to autistic people, something that's very important to teach autistic people. Um, as I said earlier, one of the, the two biggest breakthroughs for me socially were when I realized, first of all, that other people responded more like me than they didn't. And second of all, that people are completely self-focused 95% of the time. It is easier to explain to an autistic person, at least in my experience, that if they want to have more friends, do nice things for those people. I'm not saying, you know, bribe them with food or anything like that, but make a connection because it's as simple as everyone wants to be heard. And whether you really care whether this person had a great day or not is irrelevant because you want this person to be happy. Because if they're happy and you made them happy, then they may be your friend. They may like you. It's a bit utilitarian, but it comes from a good place. It comes from wanting that person to be happier. And from that angle, it's actually, from my experience, very easy to, to change the perspective of someone who doesn't have autism from this person is weird and I don't like them to, you know, they're different, but it's very clear that they're trying to improve my day. And I really appreciate that. Give it a shot. Um, modeling is super important. If you can say, well, how would, how would it make you feel in a comparable situation? It's a lot easier to understand with the assumption that other people work like you do. And of course, this is not entirely true, and I in no way mean to say that. But for all our differences, autistic people are people and function in a lot of ways similarly to neurotypicals. It may be a different trigger. Maybe instead of, oh, I'm frustrated because this person said they didn't like my shirt. Maybe it's this person didn't talk about my special interest. Maybe they were talking about something else. Maybe they were focused on themselves instead of me. Those selfish SOBs. Um, whatever it happens to be, th those same frustrations, those same feelings, you know, the joy, the sadness, the anger, the love, all are there just expressed differently under different circumstances. So find what makes your child happy or sad and then say, well, they, maybe they felt like you did with this. Autistic people don't lack empathy. They lack automatic empathy. If they understand the situation, they're going to feel bad if you feel bad. But because you are crying, they may walk in and say, you know, why are you crying? Instead of, oh, what's wrong? Because they may be thinking, well, maybe you heard great news. Or it may just be that they are thinking about a logic puzzle or trains instead of focusing on you because that's not how we're programmed. It takes effort in a way that neurotypical people don't realize. It takes a conscious decision to go down that road. And if it's worth it to the autistic person, they can manage it. I believe in all of you. It's not easy, but it's very possible. And it does take effort. So if you are the parent of an autistic child and they seem to be rude or crass or anything like that, just Take it with a grain of salt. 
understand that they may be trying. And if they're not, it may just be that you aren't either and the, the levels are naturally different. Now, social inadequacy is a big thing. Um, and it's crucially important for autistic people to have self-esteem. So I recommend to any parents out there, I think I'm running a little bit close on time here, to support your child's self-esteem however you can because it will have huge ripples throughout their life. And deficit mitigation. When I say this, I mean, let's talk about one of the more obvious social deficits, saying something unintentionally rude. If you don't know that this other person is going to react poorly to being told that their ideas are bad and they should feel bad, not much you can do about that because you didn't know it would be hurtful. If you do know that it's hurtful, however, you might not do it again. Something that I've found to be tremendously successful and highly recommend trying, both as an autistic person and for autistic people, if you are a caregiver, parent, or psychological professional, or even a teacher, is have them tell their friends and people that they interact with regularly. If I say something that's hurtful, let me know. Because frequently, I won't realize. And I will apologize if I said something hurtful but I won't if I don't know. There are a lot of other ways that these deficits can be mitigated and a lot of complex efforts that people have gone through to do so. But there's a lot of books out there for people to read. There's a lot of material written by autistic people for autistic people. Look Me in the Eye by John Elder Robeson, fantastic book. Um, I also recommend Neurotribes because, well, it's useful to know. Uh, fantastic read. And thanks for listening. Um, it's really huge to me that I got to come out today and tell my story, talk about this, share a little bit of information, and hopefully reach some people. If you want to get in touch with me, my email is jlcarver at email.wm.edu. Jill Carver on Facebook. Add me, message me saying, hey, I saw your talk, whatever. Just Get in touch with me if you have any questions or any opportunities for public speaking. Um, this is what I want to do with my life. And I hope that I've helped a couple people with, uh, what, what, um, with what they can do for their people, for their autistic people. Thank you for having me and hope you have a wonderful day.